morning. I'd like to call uh, to order the meeting of the House Committee on Business and Labor, uh, Wednesday, February 28th at 8 a.m. Uh, colleagues, today we have a, uh, one bill on our agenda. We're going to finish up the public hearing from people who signed up um, uh, on Monday. And uh, so we'll finish up that public hearing and have an opportunity for questions. Um, and I will note that uh, there is an A19 amendment on on OLIS. I don't know if all of you have it, had a chance to look at it or not, but uh, perhaps we'll have a description of that at, at, at a, some point. And uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing on Senate Bill 1596A. And Patrick, could you just give us a, a, I think everybody knows what this bill is, but uh, give us a brief summary of the bill so uh, everyone knows what we're talking about. Absolutely, Mr. Chair. The brief summary version is the measure requires a manufacturer to make available to an owner or an independent repair provider on fair and reasonable terms any documentation, tool, part, or other device or implement that is used to diagnose, maintain, repair, or update certain electronic devices if it is made available to an authorized service provider. The measure authorizes the Attorney General to initiate civil action for violations outlined in the measure that occur on or after July 1st, 2027. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'm going to go back to our sign-up sheet. I know if, uh, there's been a few new people sign up uh, today, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to those uh, folks uh, on this. So I'm going to finish up the sign-ups from uh, last Monday, and we're going to start with uh, Dustin Brighton. Dustin is online. So and if you're re on <laughs> remote, if you could unmute and uh, introduce yourself for the record. Hi. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Dusty Brighton, and I represent the Repair Done Right Coalition. I appreciate being uh, allowed to testify today. Uh, some of the arguments that uh, I am going to cover were also mentioned uh, um, in the last hearing on Monday, so I'll keep this brief. Um, the Repair Done Right Coalition is made up of companies, organizations, and people who care about ensuring that innovative products are repaired and maintained in an authorized manner. Um, these companies assist in connecting consumers, businesses, and governments through products designed to assist in improving the lives of those who use them. During the pandemic, products and services manufactured by these companies and organizations have been essential in ensuring uh, commerce and personal relations remain intact. Uh, and uh, the association feels like uh, that was accomplished. Um, the Prepared Done Right Coalition is opposed at this point to Senate Bill 1596, which would mandate OEMs of digital electronic equipment or a part of the equipment sold in Oregon to provide uh, independent repair providers with the diagnostic and repair information, software, tools, and parts. Um, but uh, uh, we feel like there could be a threat to safety and cyber security, uh, creating risk for consumers and businesses while threatening the Oregon innovation economy. Uh, OEMs currently offer consumers a wide range of safe and secure repair options through their authorized repair networks. Most consumer technology products are comprised of complex electronics, which require specialized training, sophisticated test instruments to repair safely. Some types of repairs can be extremely detailed, complicated, and dangerous, including uh, the replacement of lithium batteries, which was referenced uh, this past Monday. Manufacturers want to ensure that their products are serviced by professionals who understand the intricacies of their products and have spent time procuring the knowledge necessary to safely repair them and return them to consumers without compromising their own standards or undermining the safety and security of their products. Uh, forcing OEMs to provide uh, unauthorized repair facilities or their intellectual property with information on how to bypass consumer safety locks presents uh, unacceptable risk to consumers' data privacy. A recent study found that privacy violations already occur when consumers seek computer or phone repairs. 
with technicians accessing female customers' personal data at a higher rate than males without the contractual safeguards. So males and male and female information is at risk. Uh, the members of the Repair and Right Coalition are committed to working with the legislator to promote digital privacy and security while resisting uh, intervention in the marketplace with mandates that could compromise consumer safety and protection. Uh, we worry about uh, the citizens of Oregon. Uh, we certainly don't want to create risks for them. Thank you for allowing me to be here today and submit this testimony. Oh, thank you very much for making yourself available. Uh, I do appreciate your testimony. Uh, and up next, I'm going to go to Kirk McDowell. Good morning. Good morning. And you're not remote today. I am not remote. It's good to be here. Thanks. Um, my name is Kirk McDowell. I'm a resident of Lake Oswego, Oregon. I'm speaking. I am also president of MacArthur Security Advisors. We're a security consulting firm uh, based here in Oregon as well. This morning, however, I'm speaking on some important concerns that the security and life safety industry have with the Oregon Right to Repair Bill. I know you've received letters and heard testimony from industry leaders about their concerns, so I will shorten my talk today and get right to the, to the point. To be sure, our industry is not opposed to right to repair for appliances and equipment which are not associated with security and life safety systems. We are concerned that somebody who is untrained and unlicensed by the state be permitted to provide repairs to life safety systems for our Oregon home and businesses. Many of you have heard the term interoperability of security access control video surveillance systems. Imagine allowing someone hired to service these complex systems who do not possess a license as a limited energy technician through Oregon's building code division. An incorrect diagnostic conclusion or a possible security violation could open the system to a breach or prevent them from operating for the unintended use during a security event. Now imagine a life safety system such as a smoke detector, heat detector, or CO detector that's not being serviced properly. The electronic security industry follows strict protocols developed by the National Fire Protection Association, Underwriter Laboratories, and our local fire departments and fire districts. These agencies develop a defined code of standards which electronic security learns and follows. As a former police officer who has seen death by inoperable smoke detectors, I and the industry take this very, very seriously. We believe that you can fully support the right to repair bill and support the security and life safety industry. We only ask for a narrow safety of life safety exemption for alarm systems and related security devices. Two of the most consumer protective states, California and New York, have responded to the industry's, the alarm industry's concerns by adding an alarm exemption to the right to repair bill. And other states, Michigan, Hawaii, Arizona, and Illinois have included exemptions like California. We ask Oregon to do the same. In closing, although the right to repair bill may be a good thing for Oregon residents, without an alarm and life safety exemption, it could place our fellow citizens at risk. I thank you for allowing a fellow Oregonian to speak today to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, a question for you, uh, for Representative Graber. I know that we have very limited time. Um, I, too, am concerned about safety and security. I'm a firefighter, so I take that very seriously. The things that you're talking about um, are very alarmist. Would that apply to this building or commercial? Because I, I had I got the emails and I'm looking, and from what I can tell, this bill doesn't include commercial or industrial buildings. The the the, the fact is is that manufacturers of security alarm systems, those systems go residentially or commercially, and there has been. Um, concerns from the industry about those manufactured panels can be used both in homes and businesses. And so therefore, if a system is being serviced and somebody inadvertently or is allowed access to a, um, a default code, that can then be used to circumvent systems both residentially and commercially. Just brief hmm. follow-up. Follow -up. Um, 
I am hoping I'm going to leave this open. I think there's additional testimony coming up, but I my after reading both sides of this, my I don't believe that's accurate. So I just want to put a flag on that. I think there were some exclusions written into this bill that, um, as a firefighter, I'm okay with, I'm safe with, and it, it's always concerning to me when somebody uses you know talks about my profession and what we're doing. Says the sky is going to fall on this. So I am hoping that future testimony I won't take up any more time. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, but just wanted to flag that. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just to clarify, so you're saying that your security firm has a platform that uh, can be used by commercial, residential, and anybody uh, that, that will gain them access to all systems? There are default codes that the manufacturers install in their control panels. These control panels can be used residentially or commercially. Same manufacturer <coughs> could be the same codes. And so the concern is if some unauthorized person or somebody who is not trained inadvertently gets this code and puts it out on the web, on the dark web, Somebody then could have access to r homes and or businesses that were not a part of the original service of that system. I what you're saying. It seems odd or maybe not. Uh, I, I mean, it just seems weird that you would use the same default code for all applications for, you know, the uh, yeah. consumers. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem like a very secure uh, process. It, it actually is a a secure process. You have to remember that all the technicians are licensed, the companies are bonded, they go through specific training, and they um, they are trained to do this. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, up next from the sign-up sheet, I had uh, Paul Roberts. Is Paul Roberts available or somebody? On behalf of Paul Roberts? No? Okay. Um, and uh, Scott Brune, I think. Scott said he was not available. And he's not available today either. And <coughs> Peter Brown. Sam, I just talked to Peter this morning. Oh, he's not making it either. <laughs> so we're going quicker than I thought. Um, uh, Mike Blank. Thank you, Chair, okay. members of the committee. My name is Mike Blank with CTIA, the Trade Association for the Wireless Industry, uh, speaking in opposition to the bill. The marketplace already provides a wide range of consumer choice for, for repair with varying levels of quality, price, and convenience without the mandates imposed by this legislation. The marketplace continues to evolve and manufacturers continue to make changes to address consumer demand while offering consumers safe and rep reliable repair options. Many manufacturers have expanded repair options for consumers from growing the number of authorized repair providers, increasing access to tools, parts, and manuals directly to consumers. It's important that with more repair options available to consumers, consumers continue to have access to professional repair providers with demonstrable competence to, perform, to provide a safe and reliable repair. To further address the repair marketplace, CTIA launched two programs related to repair. The Wireless Industry Service Excellence Certification Program, or otherwise known as the WISE Program, which is mentioned on page three of the bill and the definition of independent repair provider, uh, as well as the WISE author, Authorized Service Provider Certification Program. These programs educate and test wireless device repair technicians on industry recognized standards, certify those that meet the highest standards for service quality and technical skill. The first certification of its kind, the WISE certified device repair technicians provide consumers with a predictable, high quality repair experience. The ASP program creates a network of certified retail locations, helping consumers identify qualified providers that meet the highest standards for service quality and wireless device repair. Both programs were, were created by CTIA, and we convened members representing the entire reverse logistics community to address the wireless industry's challenges and develop requirements for industry-recognized standards in repair and refurbishment of wireless devices. 
We've also also recently introduced the first ever post-secondary education mobile device repair certification program to provide an academic avenue for credentialing and certifying more device repairers. Wireless companies individually and through industry associations have taken proactive steps to provide consumers with more device repair options while accounting for the need to maintain device integrity and security and to protect intellectual property rights. These include the expansion of our WISE program to include over 19,000 certified technicians nationally, continued growth of manufacturers' ARP or authorized repair networks, and the availability of access to tools, parts, and manuals directly to consumers. The marketplace is simply addressing the same concerns this bill seeks to address. And finally, CTIA is concerned that this legislation has potential to weaken the safety, privacy, and security features of electronic products. With broad and unchecked access to technical information, security protections could easily be circumvented. In an era of sophisticated cyber attacks, we should not make it easier to hack devices and networks. For these reasons, CTIA respectfully asks that you not move this legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and up next, I have Nathan Proctor. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, if you'd introduce yourself for the record. Hi, my name is uh, Nathan Proctor. Thank you, Chair Holby. Um, I am the Senior National Campaign Director uh, for the PERG Network uh, on Right to Repair, which includes OSPERG. Um, I've been working with uh, Right to Repair efforts all over the country, and me and my team have written some, you know, 14 reports on the topic. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of these efforts as they've gotten close to a vote. And so um, I kind of understand how it gets pretty overwhelming at this point in the process and a lot of fear gets expressed. Um, I'm here to say that no nothing being brought up is new or has not yet been carefully considered. In fact, lawmakers, the FTC, and many, many independent experts have weighed in on these arguments for years. And that includes this recent um, uptick uh, from the alarm companies. Let me just point to the FTC letter, which was submitted to the committee. The FTC spent two years investigating right to repair and all the privacy and security and safety arguments were brought forward and the evidence was examined. And at the end of that, the FTC determined that there was scant evidence to support some of these scary sounding claims. But there was a lot of evidence about how harmful it is to consumers and the environment and to small Main Street businesses when re repair exists behind some kind of proprietary paywall, that that system just isn't working. We are just talking about repairing consumer goods. If that sounds like it should be pretty straightforward, it's because it really is. In terms of uh, these alarm concerns, let me just quickly say, one, licensing laws still exist in the state of Oregon, even if uh, this bill were to pass. It already exempts anything that allows for uh, overriding security set by the owner. And it only concerns consumer electronics. It's just the repair materials, right? It's just the manuals. This is not where the secret unlock codes are put in and distributed widely to everybody all their hourly employees who are, are going around, uh, you know, working on power plants. You know, I worked with many manufacturers who come around on the topic, including Google, but certainly not just them. I was just talking to another one earlier this week, and they were talking about the experience of posting their first repair materials online. They had a lot of apprehension. They had a lot of anxiety because they'd never published all this information about how the part, how their, uh, you know, electronics were taken apart and fixed. Not only did the sky not fall, but they got really great feedback from their companies. They felt like the user experience has improved, the brand loyalty improved, and they realized it was just the right thing to do, right? Specifically to these security concerns, I would say we take those really, really seriously as a public interest research group, but I just can't find objective experts outside these companies or their trade groups who at looking at the evidence agree with these conclusions. So let's not complicate this. People should be able to fix their stuff. I urge you to pass this bill and, and to reject the, the most recent amendment proposed. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Representative Brees Iverson. I have a question, Chair, if I might. Thank you. You certainly may ask a question. I appreciate that, Chair. Uh, I'm curious if you, how you feel about the Calif <laughs> excuse me, the California law that was passed. Would it be sufficient for Oregon? 
Well, I think that there are definitely ways in which um, we're trying to address certain things in the Oregon legislation that were left out of the California legislation. Um, I really like the California law. I think we're making a lot of progress, but it's also clear that there are, are issues that are gonna continue to, to exist in the repair place. Um, and I think parts pairing is obviously one area of focus where, uh, you know, after we've really looked at what it means to fix products, if we don't address how parts pairing could be used in a bad way. And again, this is, we've been talking about Apple, 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 because their company that does this technology uses this technology a lot, but, but Apple is not the only technology company out there. And if parts pairing becomes completely ubiquitous across all technology, and there's a strong financial incentive to lock, to tether the repair process through software back to the manufacturer. If that happens, it's it's really bad for consumers in the environment. So I do believe that this moves the ball forward and, and this would be one of the strongest right to repair bills in the country if it were to pass. One follow quick up. follow up. Thank you, Chair. So just to clarify though, you supported the California law and you yes. thought that was good at, at that time. Yes, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I uh, appreciate your testimony, and uh, if you don't mind staying online for a while, we may end up with some questions that uh, members may want to ask of specific uh, uh, folks in the audience. So um, if you just stay on for a little bit, that would be helpful. Uh, this, this wraps up the public testimony that was signed up on Monday. And um, I think at this point, uh, perhaps, uh, we're gonna turn to uh, Patrick, our analyst, and have him describe the Dash 19 Amendment, I believe, unless there's somebody else that wants to describe it. And Representative Brees Iverson, I should give you that opportunity to describe the Dash 19. I'll let Patrick give us our, our summary, and I'm happy to chime in. Thank you, Chair. All right, great. All right, Mr. Chair, let me take a swing at this. Uh, the Dash 19 Amendment, uh, let's see, it removes from the definition of authorized service provider original equipment manufacturers in instances where the original manufacturer does not have an arrangement with a person granted a license by the manufacturer. It revised the definition of fair and reasonable terms regarding interactions between original equipment manufacturers and independent repair providers with regard to parts availability, conditions, obligations, or restrictions, and allocation limitations or advertising restrictions. It modifies the date of applicability for consumer electronic equipment manufacturer and first sale. The current bill says January 1st, 2025. Uh, this modifies that to July 1st, 2026, so it's an 18-month um, extension there or pushing out in the future. Uh, it revises terms related to the imposition of liability on original equipment manufacturers for bodily injury or damage to consumer electronics equipment caused by the owner or independent repair provider. And it specifies that Section 1 applies to all consumer electronics equipment sold in the state <coughs> or in use of, in the state on or after July 1st, 2021, whereas the original uh, Angros version of the bill uh, makes some exceptions for cell phones, Mr. Chair. I believe that covers it, but somebody in the audience who thinks I might have gotten a detail wrong could could correct me on that, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for that. Um, and um, does anybody in the committee have questions that they still would like to ask? I just have one question, and I'd like Senator Solomon to answer that question. I think I only have one question. Okay. Don't hold me to it. I'm ready. Um, so my uh, one of my questions I've, I've heard a lot about. You know the, you know we're we're talking about a bill that basically allows repair uh, by consumers or third parties, um, and make sure that the tools and the information is available uh, to accomplish that. But we've heard a lot of concerns about privacy, about security, obviously. It seems to be a, a, a big issue. And when I was touching, uh, reading through the bill, it occurs to me that how much of a concern is that? Because the bill sort of spoke to security concerns 
a little bit. So could you elaborate uh, for me, I guess, does the bill allow security um, exemptions in this bill if it's, you know, if it's de determined that, you know, it's a huge uh, risk or, you know, it breaks into some sort of a, a problem? Because I, I always think of, you know, security issues as being a software sort of, uh, you know, hack as opposed to a part being installed. Um, and so, anyway, can you just talk to me a little bit about this, this concern about security and how, how the bill allows that security intrusion or prevents it? Um, thank you, Chair Holby. Um, for the record, my name is Janine Salman. I'm the state senator for Senate District 15, um, proud sponsor of, of Senate Bill 1596. Um, I will say to you, there has been a considerable amount of work put into this bill, having manufacturers and uh, tech industry at the table, um, bringing forward their concerns, and um, we wanted to make sure that we address that, because I can proudly say this bill is very comprehensive and collaborative. And security, uh, safety issues certainly did come up, um, and that was addressed. Not only did we look at language that was pointed to the California bill, um, we added some extra language about privacy rights, and I want to make sure that um, that I mention that currently manufacturers have built into their repair tools and parts and di diagnostics to be used by minimally um, no so so. Um, have um, have been used minimally by trained te technicians. These same parts, tools, and diagnostics can be used with equal outcomes by many, uh, by any trained technician. And and I want I want to just make a. Um, so when when that question is asked about cybersecurity. Um, people um, have concerns that we addressed, and so no way does this require anything to be disclosed. Um, and, uh, and actually, the Federal Trade Commission even um, uh, 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 came in um, and provided uh, uh, testimony in the written testimony. But also, um, we want to make sure that um, we, and I certainly can call the lifeline with um, Charlie from Osberg, but um, we wanted to make sure that no one could override anything um, without an owner's uh, authorization, any anti-theft or privacy security measures that the owner sets um, for consumer electronic equipment. So we wanted to make sure that that was extra language that was put in there, that was a protection for um, consumers. We wanted to make sure that um, uh, that there wasn't any risk, and so we brought in industry. Um, the Paul, the person has cybersecurity uh, experience. I believe he put in a letter as well. Uh, we wanted to make sure he had his input on that, and and provided um, feedback as well. So, Representative Graber. Thank you, Chair. I think I'm just distilling down on this. So I'm I'm trying to balance yeah. the information. So, looking at the bill. Yeah. And just please let me know if I'm clear on this. It doesn't require the original equipment manufacturer to make any of that any of this available without the owner's authorization or the security measures that the owner sets. Correct. And then the information that is shared in the bill is already information <coughs> that's shared with dealers and other certified users. So the certification process that we've set forward in this bill should should be that benchmark and gold standard for this. Thank you, Chair Holvey, uh, Representative Graber. I, I will note that um, the certification process was something added to this bill, as mentioned by Nathan right. Proctor, that isn't in the California bill. And it does have people going through training in the independent repair industry uh, to be certified to, to fix this equipment. But in no way does it require anybody to release any passwords. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Representative Bruce Iverson. Thank you, Chair. Senator, can you tell me the certification process? Do do does everybody have does everybody all the manufacturers at this point have a certification process in place for what we're asking them to do? Um, uh, Chair Holvey, Representative Bree Syverson, um, there is, um, I, I will just add to this that 
when that was requested to have certification, because again, we were closely looking at the California bill um, and it's not in there. So when that was requested, because people wanted the independent dealers that were that are being brought on to this to this bill, they wanted them to have an extra layer of, of um, experience and, and, and knowledge. So um, we listed in the bill, and I apologize, I could pull it up, but we listed in the bill the various different types of certifications that they could um, they could go through. Now, I will say um, the repair community was a little taken back too because of this added um, uh, added amendment uh, that was a request, and um, they were concerned that this was going to be a barrier for some of our repair shops. And um, but we felt that it was important. Uh, it was important to members. It was important to some of our industry folks. And so we felt compelled to make sure that that was added in there. And um, and, and therefore, <coughs> I have that. Can, may I? Well, yeah, no. I appreciate that. But I yeah. think my question was really more: Do the manufacturers currently have a certification process for all uh, for all the different things that we're talking about here? Chair Holvey, Representative Bree Syverson, I'm not certain if they have all what all manufacturers have. There is some uh, different, um, uh, and, and they're listed in the bill, the different types of, of training like CompTIA and um, Digituity and all of those have different A-plus types of certification. We didn't want to just narrow it to one, so we listed several different types that folks could go and have um, can, can go and, and receive their certification from. And this was never anything, this was actually a plus that was given uh, from some of the folks that are actually in opposition of this bill. Having that addition and having that added to the to the bill was was never a concern. In fact, in fact, if I might add, when I was asked by a, a manufacturer to um, to just do the California bill, um, I said, are you suggesting you don't want to have the certification process added? And they said, no, 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 we'll have that. We can add that. And so, um, and I would love to to, to answer uh, the question about the California bill. Well, I have post. one one more yeah. that I, I I'm still not sure I heard it. So the the cert, I'm not a, I'm not opposed to the certification yeah. program. I think that if we're going to allow independent people to 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 work on equipment <coughs> across the board, they should have a base idea of what they're working on. My concern is timing on this too. Huh? Do manufacturers currently have the ability to get people certified on their products because? They have currently, they've done that in-house and they offer their in-house repairs, but now we're rolling this out and telling them that they've got to make sure that everybody can, can access that. Where's the, where and how is that certification process being set up? Uh, Chair Holby, uh, Representative Bree, Bree Syverson. Now the good news is, is there is a lot of repair folks that already have this certification. They already have it because they're already doing some of this work, working on printers and and laptops and 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 cell phones. Um, they've already done the work to have this certification. So I would imagine that manufacturers do have this process. But let let me just be really clear. This bill is only about companies that already have that in-house repair process or authorized dealers. So their authorized dealers already have the certifications that they require to also have. And I, and I want to be clear because some of the confusion with previous testimony, they have to take your product, they have to diagnose it, they have to say your debunker is wrong and, and, and poor, it needs to be replaced. They need to then repair your product and send your product back to you. That is what's included in this bill, and that's what we're asking if you have an in-house process that does that, or if you have a process that is um, through your authorized dealers that has that, that's what's included in this bill. But if you don't fix your items, or if you take someone's equipment back, and then it is, uh, and you send them a, a remanufactured product back that's not yours, that's not what's in this bill. They can continue to do that. This is about if a company offers repair to an authorized dealer or does it in-house, then that's what's included in this bill. Uh, Representative Osborne. Thanks, Chair Hobley. Thank you, Senator Solomon. And thank you for all the work you've done on this bill. I, I, I do have to tell you, I love this bill, most of it. There's a couple of things I just don't like, but most of it I do love. 
So I think about when I think about the laws we make, and uh, I consider long-term unintended consequences is is probably something that I find maybe the most important thing about a bill like this. And uh, just to give you a little history, so so I worked for a company until I retired from it. I, I, we were about a twenty-four million dollar company, and I managed thirteen people in the field. And we used uh, technology with Apple um, to manage our customers, our customer management program, basically, is what it was. Um, <clears throat> It was impossible to do that on another platform because of the way the programs are written. And we spent $450,000 on that program to make it work. And it worked pretty darn well with Apple products and, and what have you. My, in, my concern about the unintended consequences is what if Apple says, you know what, we're, we're just not going to offer repair. We're not, we're not going to do that anymore. So you're going to have, we're, they're just going to abandon our state in some, potentially. And I realize that's an extreme thing. And that's just when we were a small company. I mean, there are this, I think the effects of this, we're thinking about it on a small, you know, small platform of people, but I think, I think this could be, could have some really unintended consequences. And I'd just like you to speak to that and, and tell me how your bill addresses that. Chair uh, Holby, Representative Osborne, thank you for the question. Um, I, I will tell you that um, consumers overwhelmingly in this state that have been surveyed overwhelmingly has a have asked for their right to repair the items that they own. So consumers are saying, you shouldn't make my product to where I can't have a choice in where and how I get my product fixed. Consumers will drive that, those decisions with their pocketbooks. If they purchase an item knowingly that this item will not be repaired, they will choose a different product. Imagine if you use your dollars to purchase a car and as you're pulling out of the the parking lot they tell you good luck treat it kindly because you won't be able to repair this you'll just have to treat it treat it right consumers will choose a different car because ultimately they work very hard for their dollars they want to be able to have their products last as long as they can and um, then I think that they ultimately will. So I think this bill um, is about, has, has, I can firmly look you all in the eye and say 1596 protects the consumers. It is absolutely consumer driven. And um, I want to make sure that this bill, having a right to repair, innovation will happen. More companies will be supported. 89 small businesses across Oregon say 1596 is the bill to go. Let's do it because they're ready to innovate and they're ready to fix consumers and Oregonians products. So if we want to live in a world where we accept disposable items that we have spent thousands of dollars on, then we're being very short sighted. Follow up. Uh, <laughs> Quickly. Yep. Briefly, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Solomon. I don't, I don't like the car example because in Oregon we are going to force you to drive an electric car, and those are throwaway cars. But um, that's, I, 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 I think you have addressed the question, but you haven't actually addressed. It is going to be expensive. It's going to be expensive for a lot of people potentially if Apple does pull out of, you know, or limits their uh, your ability to repair. That's my concern, right? Uh, that and, and security. That's my two concerns. So I, I thank you for your feedback and thank you, Chair Holby. Chair Holby, do you mind if I just provide a very brief response? <clears throat> Go ahead. Thank you, um, Representative Osborne. I, I appreciate the time that you have spent uh, talking with me about this bill, and I I just want to um, let you know that. If you specifically talked about Apple, Apple developed an in-house repair <laughs> process that they can, Apple Care, and um, I don't know all the names, but they developed that because their consumers were asking about repair processes, right? They didn't want to just buy their product. Now, they actually make a lot of money in their repair process. Um, it is very expensive. So all this bill is about is making sure that if a company offers that repair process, as I stated, if they fix your product, if they have it with authorized dealers, then we need to open that up to making sure that um, our small Oregon businesses can thrive as well and can, and can give consumers, Oregonians, a better opportunity for an affordable choice to repair their items. 
Thank you. I appreciate that response because it occurs to me that, you know, as I'm thinking about being a consumer myself, you know, if I have a product that I really like, you know, I'm, I'm more likely than not probably to get it repaired by, you know, an authorized repair shop that, you know, is certified, you know, just I would probably choose to do that. But some consumers may go, I just can't afford that. What you're saying is consumers should have the right to choose, you know, to get their product that they own repaired somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I mean, that's sort of a maybe an oversimplification simpli of, of this debate. But at the end of the day, I think consumers should have a choice. And uh, if they make a bad choice, they probably won't make that bad choice again, I, I get, I'm guessing. Chair Holby, anyway. I, would, I will say that um, Senator Kim Thatcher, um, that is, if you listen to her testimony, that is exactly what it is centered on, is that the freedom of choice and consumers having the ability to take their product and decide, they may decide to still take it to the Apple store, but they may decide that their pocketbook doesn't allow them to make that choice, and so they may decide they want to go to a corner um, repair house that they they have a, a familiar relationship with to get a more affordable choice for the repair. Mm -hmm. Representative Sharf. Thank you, Chair Holby. Thank you, Senator Solomon. Um, and I may have missed this, but Representative Osborne said something, and I just need to clarify. Yeah. So if a company manufactures a product, and they don't even manufacture it in Oregon, but they sell it in Oregon, and they don't repair it in Oregon, all their repairs are done in another state or another country, are they still obligated under this law? Because we don't manufacture a lot of stuff in this state anymore. Chair Holvey, Representative Scharf, thank you for that question. And I also appreciate the many questions that you have um, gone through <laughs> and, and with me um, and talked talk that with me. Um, I, I will tell you that um, this bill is about if a company offers a repair process, whether they take your item by mail, whether they take your item in a store, um, it, it says to them that they have, but again, the very, very important detail is they have to take your product back. They have to diagnose your product and they have to fix it and send your product back to you. The majority of the mail-in type of, of service is they will send you a manufactured right. likeness back. That's not covered in this bill. They can continue to do that. And as a consumer, you can choose with your dollars to, su to support a company that does that because you're getting <coughs> your product back. But the bottom line is, is that we just want, uh, uh, in this particular bill, it only says if you have that process set up, that you offer that repair of somebody's personal, you know, their item, and then you send, fix it and send it back to them. Thank you. Yeah, Your thank you. Hudson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, um, we talked a lot on Monday about parts pairing and how that worked in this bill. And then we've heard today uh, a lot of comparisons to the California bill. Could you talk about how this bill might be similar or different than what California has done? Thank you. Um, uh, Chair Holvey, Representative Hudson, um, there are a lot of similarities in the California bill. Um, we looked at that right after session. And I, I will tell you, this is the fourth time this bill has come before us, right? Um, and the, it, it looks very different from the last three. And because the repair movement is happening, more states are developing right to repair language. Um, there is parts pairing language in the Oregon bill that is not in the California bill. But I want to be clear that the California language that was amended or taken out before it became a draft is very different than our language. So it says that you cannot require a consumer to, uh, you cannot require them to access the internet for parts pairing. Well, manufacturers were like, time out, including Google. They didn't support the California model because they parts pair. And how they do that is they have you connect with the internet and get on, parts pair your, your parts, go about your day, and, and, and you're done. The California bill says that internet language. 
That was our last year language. This year's language says parts pair, go forth and prosper, but just don't add anti-consumer behavior when you're parts pairing. Don't inhibit the repair process. Don't send misleading messages that consumers with their brains can't go, okay, I read it, delete, and they delete it. And don't slow the functionality of a phone down or a product, doesn't say phone, of your product down, um, unless there's a thermal occurrence, because we heard about that and we added that to our, um, and we heard about that here, batteries, right? that they can slow the process down. That wasn't just an Apple concern that was brought forward. That was an HP concern, and they asked. And so we put that amendment in that said, okay, if you're, you know, if there's a safety issue, you certainly can do that. And it's also, I, I also want to be clear that, you know, this bill brings out a lot of FUD, <laughs> a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of doubt. And I want to be clear that if there is a safety issue, they can send you that message. If you're concerned about a safety issue of your phone or your product, they can send you that message. We didn't tell them they couldn't send you that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Representative Vilmer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, and thanks for all the conversation. You've Thank given you. time to me on this. Uh, when you were talking about the certification process, I understand in the bill there's an A-plus certification for the computers, but is there that same quality of certification for everything else? Um, Chair Holby, Representative Elmer, there is some different, there, it's certified, certifications are for any, anything involved in this bill around consumer electronics. If it is a repair, an independent dealer, they have to be certified. So if I, if I remember, and this can be super impressive to you all, I believe there is an A-best certification in there that is about other products that, that, that they would need to be um, certified. And that's going to be like my golden moment if I actually got that right. But, um, but there is a list in there of different certifications because any product that is involved in this bill, and again, I won't reiterate the repair process, but um, any product that is in there that, that says if you're an independent dealer, you have to go through that certification. Okay. Representative Sosa. Thank you, Chair Holvey. Um, Senator, uh, in looking at the language of the bill, this is, uh, I just wanna make sure I'm reading it correctly because the, the question of alerts came up. Um, and it says in here that uh, the, the original equipment manufacturer may not use parts pairing to, and then if you jump down to section yeah. C, cause consumer electronic equipment to display misleading alerts or warnings, which the owner cannot immediately dismiss about unidentified parts. I just want to make sure I'm reading this correctly, uh, that what is prohibited is misleading alerts or misleading warnings. I assume misleading applies to both alerts or warnings, <coughs> such that if it's a legitimate alert or warning about something, that's still acceptable. But if it's misleading alerts or misleading warnings, that would be prohibited. Do I understand that correctly? Um, Chair Holvey, Representative Sosa, you did understand that correctly in that. And I just also want to be clear that I think perhaps you're looking at the, uh, the version what, that wasn't uh, not the amended version, because in the amended version, we took out the word unnecessary because it, unnecessary that that was a conversation that we had um, with with um, with Apple. Uh, they were pleased to find misleading and so uh, or unnecessary. And so we we, def, you know, said, OK, we will just go with misleading and making sure that um, that that could be addressed. But if it's safe to you, spot on. great. Thank you. Representative Bree Iverson, last question. Thank you, Chair. You, th Senator, you, you made a comment, and I, I kind of want to circle back to it. I, I'm assuming that there's some clarification we can have on it. You said that unless there is a thermal occurrence, and you said that with regard to parts pairing, and it, it just kind of begs the question of there has to be a thermal occurrence first because then my phone's already blown up. So, um, Chair Holvey, Representative Bree Iverson, if you have a thermal occurrence, your, it doesn't mean your phone's going to blow up. So just it could. like, I, no, I just, I just want to, I just want to take out a little FUD, <laughs> right? Well, I, I want to, I know, my phone. I, I know you're concerned, <laughs> but, your chair, but, but what happens is um, we heard from more than just Apple about if a temperature, if they're monitoring and that your phone says you have a temperature that's rising on your, on your, on your battery, right? 
they can reduce the functionality so that the energy put into that phone is taking the temperature down on your battery. They can start cutting, slowing down your apps and doing the things so that it doesn't make your battery work so hard, right? So when they do that, it reduces the functionality of your phone because you might not be able to get into every single crossword puzzle and everything at that time because right there, they're protecting you, right? And that's not just a cell phone issue. We heard about this in laptops. So when a thermal occurrence, in, in the event of a thermal occurrence, doesn't mean your phone's gonna blow. It just means your phone is get your battery's getting a little hot. We need to take some fire off of it, so. So again, if I might share, just follow clarification up. of it, follow-up clarification. So, so in the event of it, it, it prohibits parts pairing for the purpose of reducing the functionality of a battery. So we prohibit it only after there's a thermal event that occurs. I, I'm trying to get the, the wording of how, of the intent of the wording here. Perfect. Um, Chair Holvey, Representative Bree Syverson, um, and I, I apologize, I don't have it pulled up here to look at the, the language, but it basically when we talked about the parts pairing language, we just said can't inhibit the independent repair process. You cannot, um, you cannot send uh, misleading messages that a customer can't go, got it, delete, and then it pops up again and then pops up again. We didn't want to have that happen because that is a known issue. And, um, and then we didn't want it to make sure that, um, that on the functionality is that we, everything that we were hearing about the concerns and the FUD and everything else was about batteries. And we said, we want to just make sure that if that's already a process that's built into your phone, that it already does that. This bill doesn't give it that magical power to do that. It already does that. We just wanted to say, Go forth and prosper with that. You can do that to cool the battery down and prevent it from overheating. It might just overheat. It's not going to, it might not blow. So, um, so we wanted to prevent that. And that's why we heard from manufacturers. And that's why we put that in the bill. We responded. I can tell you. Thank you, Senator yes, Solomon. Okay. <laughs> I, I think uh, we've, we've uh, okay. probably heard enough. All I'm right. going to close. I'm having a thermal occurrence myself, as my friend, <laughs> <laughs> as my friend well, Senator well. Lieber said. I can't claim that line. She did. So Somebody now I get it. And, and in light of that, I'm going to close the public hearing and stand at ease for a few okay. moments. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to bring the House Committee on Business and Labor back to order. And we've just finished our public hearing on Senate Bill 1596A. I'm going to open a work session on Senate Bill 1596A. And Patrick, I think you've already given us a review of the bill. I know we do have an amendment on the bill. Um, and so I'm open to a motion on the amendment if that is desired it is desired chair <laughs> chair i move that we adopt the dash 19 to this bill uh, representative brees iverson moves to adopt the dash a19 amendment to senate bill 1596 is there discussion representative brees iverson thank you chair Colleagues, I just want to say that we've heard a lot about this issue for many years, and I feel like this bill has come a long way, and I, I don't want to in any way suggest that the Senator hasn't done a lot of due diligence in putting together this version for, for what we have in front of us. I do feel like there's some things that we have heard repetitively from the industry as the conversation has adjusted, and I feel like this amendment does answer some of those concerns while the industry can move forward with what with with putting a system in place to protect consumers and allow industries manufacturers to meet the next goal and that is that is the intent of what what this amendment is for so i think it is a a good place for us to get on board and have a working relationship forward instead of having manufacturers start saying what the heck is oregon doing and putting them in a place where they can't comply therefore i encourage a yes vote on the amendment thank you thank you other discussion on the A19? 
Re Representative Osborne. Uh, thank you, Chair Holby. I, I would like to just echo what uh, Representative Bruce Hyverson said, and I, and I think that the Dash 19 kind of brings this thing into an area where we could, we all should support, and I would be, I wholeheartedly support this bill and brag about it if we could just pass the 19. So I encourage a yes vote, and, and I really, really, truly appreciate the amount of work that Senator Solomon has put into this, because she's probably my favorite senator. I mean, I've seen her more in the last couple weeks than I've ever seen her since I've been in the building. So thank you for your efforts, and I want to support your bill really bad <clears throat> and uh, thank you I appreciate that I mean I, I looked at the a19 and it uh, it seemed like it was pretty expansive in its uh, I guess effect of exempting most of the bill almost uh, almost uh, taking the bill to a, a useless uh, uh, place and so it was overly broad I thought and uh, from my opinion, so I won't be supporting uh, the A19, and I appreciate uh, the the discussion. I know it's uh, been I've tried to spend enough time on it to people take their positions, and I respect uh, the positions that people have. So, with that, could we have a, a roll call vote on the dash A19s, please? Representative Bossar Davis. Excused. Representative Bruce Iverson. Yes. Representative Graber. No. Representative Hudson? No. Representative Nelson? No. Representative Note? No. Representative Osborne? Yes. Representative Sharp? Yes. Vice Chair Elmer? Yes. Vice Chair Sosa? No. Chair Holby? No. Uh, the A19 uh, amendment is failed and is not adopted. Uh, Chair, I move uh, SB 1596A to the floor of the due pass recommendation. Uh, Vice Chair Sosa moves Senate Bill 1596A to the floor with a due pass recommendation. Discussion? Seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Representative Bossart Davis? Excused. Ex Representative Reese Iverson? No. Representative Driver? Yes. Representative Hudson? Yes. Representative Nelson? Yes. Representative Nose? Yes. Representative Osborne? No. Representative Sharp? Yes. Vice Chair Elmer? No. Vice Chair Sosa? Aye. Chair Holby? Aye. Uh, the motion passes. <coughs> Chair Holby. And uh, we will have. It's um, good to keep people guessing. Representative Neron carry that bill on the floor. And Representative Osborne? I will be filing a minority report on this. Representative uh, Osborne serves notice of a minority report. And Patrick, uh, can you yes, provide I can. them? He needs a, oh. to turn it in by when? Uh, so, yeah, so the, the amendment has to be to me uh, by 5 o'clock the following day. So that's tomorrow. Yep. And then, uh, and that will have to be uh, you and a co signer. <laughs> Uh, and um, and then we will process that through fiscal and revenue and drop the paperwork assessment. Yeah. And fine. if you have any other questions, I can answer those. That's just off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, minority reports are not something I do a lot. So. But I, <laughs> Me neither. But I've been around a while, so I don't know. So. Uh, You're just on the wrong committee. I know. That's right. I <laughs> boring committees. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, with that, I'm going to close the work session on Senate Bill 1596. And colleagues, I, I would just like to say I want to thank all of you for uh, sticking out uh, the, in this uh, session, in this last session this and last meeting of the House Business and Labor Committee for uh, the 24 session. So I appreciate all your work. I appreciate. Uh, your attentiveness and making the decisions and taking the votes that you took. I appreciate all that and respect it all. So thank you very much. With that, I'm going to close uh, and adjourn the House Committee on Business and Labor.